So today is Senior Sunday. Um, I love Senior Sunday. Really not because our students are leaving us, obviously, uh, but more so because we get to celebrate the fact that they are passing from one chapter in their life uh, into the next chapter. Um, um, and so I've got a bunch of seniors uh, in this room today. I would like for them to come up here right now in front of the stage. So seniors, if you're here, uh, please come stand up here in front of the stage. <laughs> We have a bunch of other seniors actually in our group. Um, some of them are actually serving at other churches this morning. Some of them lead worship in other churches, but they are still very much a part of our youth group. Um, and these are just a few of the seniors that have been involved here uh, over the course of several years, uh, like Ashlyn, eight years, some of them just a year. Uh, but we're very grateful to have them. Um, and after the service today, um, they are going to go with their families, um, and they're going to be in the Family Life Center, and they're going to be in the gymnasium hanging out. And they have tables set up, uh, and there's little cards that you can pick up at the dessert table. And what we encourage you to do as a church uh, is write a little word of encouragement, maybe a Bible verse or a, a word of wisdom for these seniors, and walk around uh, and place it on their table, uh, and just let them know that... Um, that you're supporting them, that you're praying for them as they transition from this season of life uh, onto the next. Um, but so, anybody, everybody, give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Y'all go back and sit down. And I am very excited to be able to bring the word to you guys this morning. Um, and uh, Eric, you can put my 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 sermon slide up there today. Uh, that's, the, that's the title of the sermon today. Um, some of you, I'm the, I'm the youth pastor, so I can make whatever title slot I want for Senior Sunday. Uh, and this is the slide that, uh, that came to mind when I was preparing for this message. Uh, some of you might need a Gen Z dictionary as you sit here today uh, and go over scripture with us. Um, but please turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. That is where we are going to be starting. And it, I know it's three verses. How could you possibly come up with a sermon that's over 35, 30 minutes long? Um, but there's a lot here for us to take in, a lot for us to read. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, begin with a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. God, I thank you for this morning. And God, I thank you for these seniors that are here. And I thank you for their families, Lord. Lord, I thank you for everybody that's gathered here this morning, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would be, would be present, that it would touch our hearts. Lord, as we examine your word, Lord, really we're not reading scripture, but God, scripture examines us. Lord, it's like a mirror and we look into it, God, we see the areas of our life, um, God, that need to be offered up to you. And God, I pray that when we examine your text this morning, Lord, that we would, we would focus on, on our hearts and our heart posture towards you, God. Lord, do we really love you? Do we really know you? And Lord, I pray that as we walk through this text, God, that you would pierce even the darkest heart, Lord. And Lord, we would be willing and available to respond to your word in humility. In your name I pray. Amen. And so before we get started, I'm going to read for you again. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so this is really interesting because the, the, the context of this text is really revolving around this world and the love for the Father. Uh, and when you look at the writings of John, when you look at uh, his gospel, when you look at John's gospel, he uses this word world often, and he uses it in different senses. And when you get into his epistles, he still uses the same word. However, this word has different meanings. And so when John says, do not love the world, 
It's kind of weird because you think of John's gospel and it says, for God so loved the world. And, and, and even more so, it says that we are supposed to love people in the world. The world collectively is God's, the people that God has created. And so does John mean that we can't love the world? Does John mean that we can't love this collective group of people in the world that even God loves? Or in another sense, he uses the world to mean creation, just the created world that God breathed out in Genesis chapter 1. And he spoke into existence this world that we live in and walk on. All the green, all the water, all the birds, the animals, everything that you see God created. Does God mean don't love that world? Surely not. God doesn't mean don't love the created world. God doesn't mean don't love people in the world. There's nothing wrong with loving the world in those senses. In fact, God loves those things of this world. And so, yes, we too are called to love the things in this world. But John, in a different sense, there's a different meaning here when John says, do not love the world is very different. The word world here means cosmos. And essentially, it is to put in order, or the order of things, or the system of things. When you look at the original Greek, cosmos, you also see this word in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. They're addressing women and talking about their heart, and no, it's not just about what you wear. And that word, your adornment, is also cosmos, which is also, y'all probably recognize the word cosmetics. And so when women are putting on makeup or putting on cosmetics, they're putting their face in order. Praise God, Allie put her face in order this morning. Hallelujah. Amen, right? No, Allie's beautiful without makeup. She does not need it. But that might be what you think of, to put in order. And that's kind of how you can think of this context, is to put in order. The world in this sense, John is telling us, that it's the operational system set up by the devil that seeks to captivate the hearts of men on the basis of ungodly thoughts, attitudes, motives, values, and goals. It does not seek to promote God's glory or to submit to his word. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, we see this. John writes, We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. When you think of the world in this sense as an operational system set up by the devil, it's not hard to see that the world has the same appetite as the devil. The world seeks the things of the devil. The world seeks what is evil. The world seeks what opposes God, the word seeks to be, the world seeks to be rebellious to God and rebellious to his word. Satan is out to bribe you with the things of the world. The world gratifies your flesh. It fuels our pride, our passion for power, money, and places of high esteem. If you make it your life mission to gain these things, the enemy will give it to you. He will gladly give you the things of this world because he knows that if you have these things in your life, you will be separated from a relationship with God. The enemy schemes, he is a liar and a cheat, and he will lie to you and tell you that these things are better than the things that God has to offer you. That's right. And so we have to be on guard. We have to recognize this, that John is talking about this world order, this world system that is set up by the devil and not from God. Let us look at a little bit of what John and other writers in the New Testament say about uh, the world in this context. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 16 through 17, it says, I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. The world does not know God. And not only does the world not know God, but what John is telling us here is that it does not have his spirit either. That is why when you say that everybody is a child of God, that is wrong contradiction to God's word because the world 
does not have God's spirit and it does not know God. People living in worldliness, people who are consumed by the world, living for themselves, they do not have the spirit of God in them. They are blind, held captive by this system set up by the devil to destroy you, to bring you down with him. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to what? Deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. God has appeared in flesh. We know him as Jesus, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And all throughout his life, you could see that he was instructing people to deny this system set up by the devil. John chapter 17, verse 15 through 18 says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. This is Jesus talking to his father. But to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth as you sent me into the world. I also have sent them into the world. We, as believers, if you are here calling yourself a believer, a follower in Christ, born again, you are in this world. You are in this system. But you are not the same as it. It's like a fish swimming in the ocean. You're in the ocean. The water's all around you, but it's not part, it's not inside you. You are, you are in the world, but you are called to be very, very different than the way the world lives and acts. Now, as we continue on in this text, it says, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does John mean by this? Well, it's simply this. You cannot love both God and the world. Did y'all know that we have a jealous God? That God is jealous for you and he doesn't want to share you. God does not want to share you with the world. Listen to what is written in Exodus chapter 34. It says, be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Je Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather, you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram. For you will not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants, and they would play the harlot. And you would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. God does not want you sacrificing to the gods of this world. God does not want you playing the harlot with the gods of this world. God doesn't want you cheating on him, essentially is what that is saying. God is a jealous God, and he's not sharing you with the world. You cannot love both God and the world at the same time. And this is a test. There are tests all throughout 1 John. This epistle has many tests in them to examine your life, to look at your life and say, what does my heart look like in relation to God? And so this is the first test. Do you love the world or do you love God? Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So this morning, as we continue to dive into this text, please examine yourself. Examine your heart. And see if you have a love for the things of this world, or if you are seeking those things, if you're seeking those things and putting them on the throne of your heart. And I think it is significant that John is directing our attention to our hearts, because that's the source of your devotion. One of my favorite Proverbs is 423, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the spring of life. Watch your heart. What has your devotion? What's sitting on the throne of your heart? Is it the spirit of God or is it the world? Is it the things of this world? Have you ever heard this term? Think about it. Think about it. Have you ever heard the term worldly Christian? 
That is a contradictory term to scripture. It's the same thing as calling Satan a heavenly devil. It is contradictory to the Bible. Worldly Christian. But unfortunately, that is often what the world sees the church portray. One reason I believe the church is not as effective as it should be is because we call ourselves the people of God, just like Israel. But every time the world looks at us, they just see a bunch of people worshiping a different golden calf. Pursuing worldliness, not looking any different. Worshiping idols. These idols might not look like gold statues. They're very different today in our culture, but they're still idols. James 4, 1 through 4 says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Scripture is very clear. You cannot love both. The genuine Christian is marked by his or, love, his or her love for the Lord. Let us continue and it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Verse 16. These are the areas where Satan likes to attack us. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but professional football teams have like 100 plays in their playbook. And I don't know if y'all just watched the draft, but all these rookie quarterbacks that just got drafted are going to have a lot of work to do memorizing this playbook. Satan's playbook is three plays, and it's been that way from the beginning. And John outlines it right here for us. And you can see it in Scripture also. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When you go back and you look at the Garden of Eden, what happened in Genesis chapter 3? The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it fruit and ate, and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. The fruit, lust of the eyes, was beautiful to look on. Lust of the flesh, it was pleasant to eat. Pride of life made her God, or wise like God. We also see this same strategy when Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by the devil right before he starts his ministry. He's fasted for 40 days, and on the last day of his fast, the tempter comes to him. In chapter 4, verse 3 of Matthew, and he came in and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister bread from stone, kingdoms of the world, and the pride of life. It is easy to see that Satan is attacking us in these ways. So let's talk about these three in more depth and more detail. First, John mentions in verse 16 is the lust of the flesh. And many of you may have a Bible translation which calls it the desire of the flesh. That is also Accurate. Another calls it the craving for physical pleasure, which also conveys the idea of will. The desires of the flesh are those things that your body wants to engage in. And God created you with natural desires to eat. God created you with a sex drive to use when you get married. God created you to do many things that your body 
physically needs or craves. And those things inherently of themselves are not bad because what God created them. However, the enemy comes in and twists these things to make you desire those things over the things of God. So the desire of the flesh is this desire to feel. This desire to engage in things that will satisfy our body. As a Christian, your body, though redeemed by Christ, has not yet been glorified. One day that will change. We will exchange these mortal bodies for heavenly bodies, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us. However, this has not happened yet. Therefore, we still experience strong desires in our earthly body. And the devil wants to come in and twist those desires and make you use them in a sinful way. The world takes natural desires like sex drive or hunger pains and turns them into immorality and gluttony. This, these temptations appeal to this particular part of us, which is our flesh. And if we engage in this, we will long to experience these things outside of God's will for our lives. Many of us may even attach our feelings to substances. We may turn to alcohol or drugs or marijuana, and your flesh craves these things because our body likes how it feels. Our body likes how these things make us feel. I, I also know that Americans fall into this trap of passive consumption. How often do you wake up and the very first thing you long for is your cell phone? To wake up and just scroll mindlessly through Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat. Your flesh, that's a craving of your flesh. And social media inherently of itself is not evil. But Satan is definitely using it to consume your mind. That's right. That's right. To take your focus off of your relationship and devotion to the Lord. And we Americans passively consume tons of stuff. It's not just social media. It's Netflix. It's the news. Fox News is the passive consumption of the age 50 and above. <laughs> it is. You just want to watch what they have to say about what's going on with Joe Biden, or they make fun of him. And you passively consume this. What if instead we passively consumed the bread of life? That's right, right. What if instead the desires that are deep inside this mortal body was, God, I want to wake up and spend time on my hands and knees and in your word, passively consuming the bread of life that really satisfies you, that destroys that, that longing for something? Jesus is what... We should be longing for to spend time in his word. And I can't forget, obviously, the world order is set up to destroy marriage. And the world order seeks to gratify that desire in your flesh. People too often get trapped by their lust for sexual gratification outside of the marriage covenant that God has set up. Satan destroys marriages this way. The world destroys marriages. It destroys how you view men and women, and it hurts the image of a holy God who created sex. The lust of the flesh is to feel something that has been twisted by the enemy. Something God created to be beautiful, but has been corrupted by culture. And we have bought the lie. Romans 12, 1 through 10. How do we fight this? How do we fight this desire to uh, gratify our flesh? Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't give an inch to your flesh, is what Paul is saying. Don't give an inch. Transform your mind daily. Allow God's word to remo renew your mind 
daily. Offer your body up as a spiritual sacrifice, pleasing to God that is holy and acceptable daily. When I was sitting down this morning and I was thinking about this, the Lord in my nurse brain, I feel like gave me this. Did you know that your body has natural T killer cells? And it is your body's first line of defense against pathogens and keyword here, cancer. Many of you might not know this and it might scare you, I'm sorry, but this is fact. Cancer cells are always present in your body and ready to strike, believe it or not. And they strike in a moment's notice. But you have these natural killer cells that God blessed you with in your immune system that are efficient assassins and eliminate up to possibly six cancer cells per day in your body. But you know what happens when you get cancer? Typically, it's because you've done something to your immune system that has weakened it. Your immune system is compromised by things like stress, lack of sleep, eating highly processed foods over and over and over again. There are many things that we do that weaken our immune system and weaken our body, which allow these cancer cells a way in. And then you develop cancer. When your immune system is compromised, it opens the door for that cancer cell. But what I'm trying to tell you guys is when you compromise or give an inch to the lust of your flesh, it consumes your body. Right. It takes over. Do not give an inch. Sacrifice your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord daily. Make no compromise for the lust of the flesh. No compromise. Don't com don't car compartmentalize or segmentize your life into little places where this is for the Lord and this is not. No, because eventually it'll all be not for the Lord. Right. John then points out the lust of the eyes, and this is the desire to have what you see. First, the desire to feel, now it's the desire to have. And I talked about social media earlier, and it is a bigger problem now than it ever has been before. This desire to have. And it is defined as greed. Google defines greed as an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. If you go to vocabulary.com, it takes it a little bit further, calling it ugly and insatiable, and gives us the origin word, what greed comes from, which is voracious, always hungry for more. <coughs> A person can be insatiably hungry for money, but also... For fame, possessions, attention, compliments, gifts, another person's time, and the list goes on. Greed is always self-centered and never satisfied. Luke 12, 15 says, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Ephesians 5, 5, for you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Greed has also consumed our society. The lust of our eyes has also consumed our desired society. We always want the bigger house. We always want a better body. We always want more money. We always want what our neighbor has. We always want that yard. We always want that car. We always want, 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 want. And it's because we're gratifying our eyes. This lust to have. How do we combat greed? Just like the flesh, don't give an inch. Don't compromise to your flesh. Greed is a little different, but it also takes sacrifice. Generosity. 1 Timothy 6, 17. As the rich in this present age charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And then of course the rich young ruler, the young man said to him being Jesus, all these things I have kept, meaning the law, what am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away grieving for he was one who owned 
much property. Generosity is hard. But what generosity does is it yields victory over the power of money, over the power to have more. When we are generous with our fellow man or our local church or another ministry, we will find a release, a release on the grip that money has on us. Money is neither good nor evil. It's a tool. And generosity keeps us from allowing money to use us, to consume us. Second, generosity yields victory over the power of possessions. Commercialism has engulfed our society. I know you can see that. I was just having a talk with Kenneth earlier about the movement out. He said, dang, look at all this junk we have. Sorry, Kenneth, call you out, but I love you. <laughs> it was just something that came to my mind. We, as Americans, just store up possessions because we always want more. We always want to have more. What Jesus is telling us is that if we're generous and just say, okay, God, I'm giving all these things to you. I'm giving these things to others. It vanquishes that power to always have more for yourself. Third, generosity yields victory over the pool of comfort. We often want to trust many other things rather than God. But generosity <laughs> helps us trust in him because we have less to trust ourselves with. The last one that John mentions here, the boastful pride of life. Men particularly struggle with this. We don't like to show we need things. We don't like to show our soft, sensitive sides. Craig cries, believe it or not. I know you see him do it from here. I cry, believe it or not, a lot. But we are often competitive by nature. And this follows us into comparing our salaries, our square footage of our homes, our spiritual service even. The pride of life is the sin of being arrogant or boastful about what one has or has achieved. It is the sin of seeing others as inferior on account of your achievements or personality or status. Examples are self-righteousness or feeling more righteous than others feeling more important than others on account of your beauty, fame, etc. Lording yourself over because of your position, achievement, riches. To be glory-seeking is the pride of life. Pride is founded on titles, offices, and riches and is not from God. If you look at Jesus, he was the ultimate lowly servant. He was meek. He was contrite. And he was always seeking to serve someone else not seeking for people to serve him. Matthew 23, 27-28 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The Pharisees took care of what people could see and took pride in it, but they neglected what God could see, the inside, their heart, the pride in their life, which was their motivating factor behind what they did. They painted the outside, leaving the inside full of worldly pride. In their eyes, if they followed the law to the letter, they were holy, and the conditions of their heart wouldn't matter. I believe that this is a trap for Christians. Do y'all know that Satan will give you feelings of ultra godliness as long as he can lead you into real worldliness? Do you know that? God desires not your sacrifices, but your heart. Will you lay them down at his feet? I think back to, uh, this is kind of a funny story if you want to go read it. <laughs> but I think, uh, when I think of pride, obviously the antidote to that is humility. And I think of uh, the story of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, it says, is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Y'all know what happened immediately after that? 
God drove him out into the field to live as a wild beast until his heart was humbled. <laughs> Just imagine this guy, King, he's thinking he's the hot stuff, and then all of a sudden he's out there walking around like a cow. Humbled. <laughs> we must be careful not to fall into this trap of pride, and we must combat it with humility. While studying for this sermon, I ran across a quote. It says, pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. And that is so true. We must remember our origin. We came from dust. God is the only one who has it. He gets the glory. Satan wants to put you on a pedestal to be self-absorbed. But we must resist this urge and be men and women of humility and meekness. And must cultivate the desire to exalt Christ's name above every other name without promoting ourselves. James 4, 6, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We must submit to God. Listen to him, obey him. We must be tender and contrite, not proud and stiff-necked, and we must take our place as dust at his feet and recognize that it is his breath in us. Notice that when, you, when we read earlier about Jesus' uh, interaction with the devil, notice that Jesus, being God, didn't go ultra God mode on Satan. He didn't say, Satan, I'm God, bow before me. You want me to bow before you? I'm God. Jesus defeated that temptation being completely human also. What I think we need to see from that interaction is you don't need to be God to beat the devil. You need to be a man submitted to God to beat the devil. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We must be men and women of humility that seek that out, to seek to be humble for the Lord. And then the last verse, the world is passing away and also is lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The world is passing away. Hallelujah. Amen. It is going to be gone one day. And John is telling us in this passage that we can indeed waste our life pursuing that the, all that the world has to offer. When you die, listen, listen to me, because I've seen many people pass from this life to the next, whether they're eternity with God or eternity with the devil. You cannot pack up a U-Haul and take all the stuff with you when you die. I don't know if that's news to you or not. But there's no packing up your diploma. There's no going to the bank and withdrawing all of your money out of the bank account. There's no taking your pride, all the stuff that you've gathered over the years of your life. There's no taking your standing in this world, your net worth, whatever is important to you, your investments. That all goes away when you pass from this life on to the next. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God will live forever or abide forever. Now, what is John saying here? Obviously, all Christians live forever. Obviously, we will be with Jesus in eternity. It's a little different. John is not necessarily talking about eternal life when he uses the phrase abides forever. The point is that those who walk in fellowship with God enjoy doing something that will last forever. We want to be an asset, not a liability to the cause of Christ in time. For when we do that, it will last forever. By the way, an asset is something that gives back, a liability is something that takes back. That's your uh, money class for today. Um, I recently heard a pastor who was preaching over Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. And he said that there are countless people burning in hell right now because of lukewarm Christians. I would argue that's the same thing for worldly Christians. Countless people who see you living a worldly life and it leads them astray. Seniors, you see the title of my slide? That's for you guys. I hope you all proud of me. That's the closest to your lingo I'll probably ever get from for the rest of my life. Um, for those of you who don't know, raise your hand if you know what it, what this what this means. 
As I have an argument with Eric earlier, <laughs> Eric, I won. Uh, most of y'all know what this means. It means you only live once. Oh, my God. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and that is true. In this life, you do only live once. You get one shot. But this is obviously what the world will tell you. And when you get away from the covering of your parents, y'all are seniors, and you go off to college, or you go off to, to, to your job site, I'm sure maybe you even experience it now in high school, the world will tell you, you only live once. It will tell you, rack up your body count when you get to college. Go drink as much as possible. Live your life to the fullest. You only live once. You only get one chance to do all the things that your heart desires. And it will destroy you. Sorry. Amen. Guys, you cannot let the world deceive you into thinking that you only have one chance to do what your heart desires because God called you to store your treasure in heaven right. not here on this earth and I care about you guys Amen. and I do not want you to fall into this trap right. Right. Amen. I don't want your life to be destroyed YOLO is a, that is a lie Because God's word says, if you're born again, then you're a vagabond. You're a, a pilgrim passing from this life to the next. Amen. So some questions, church. What causes the deeper sorrow in your life? A temporal loss of this world that is passing away. Or breaking your fellowship with God. What most dominates your mind? Thoughts and schemes of worldly advancements or resolutions and efforts to grow in God's grace and knowledge of who he is. Some of us need to make a basic choice. Are you going to continue to love the world or love God? Are you going to submit to him? Are you going to repent of living for things that won't last forever and say, God, I'm going to choose to live for you and do the things that are going to store up treasure in eternity. I'm going to live for your will in my life. That's what remains forever. That's what abides forever. <clears throat> Most of us, some of us have made this choice, God, but we've maybe fallen into a trap we need to come and, and be on our knees as dust before a God who's holy and doesn't want to share us. Do not yield to the temptations of this world, seniors. It wants to destroy you. But do the will of God and you will abide forever. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today and I thank you for your word, Lord. God, I thank you for these seniors that are here this morning. And God, I pray that you would prick their heart, God. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, motivate them to set up things in their, in their hearts, Lord, that won't allow the world inside and destroy them in their walks with you. And Lord, I pray for people in this room, God, that are, that are struggling with worldliness, Lord, that have fallen for the lie, maybe, Lord, they have never even given their life to you, but they've just been living their life for themselves, God. I pray that they would come and surrender their lives to you, God, and start pursuing what is meaningful. Jesus, we love you. It's your name, I pray.